ser o no ser ese es el dilema si acaso es más noble para el espíritu el sufrir las piedras y dardos de la ultrajante fortuna o el tomar las armas contra un mar de problemas para oponiéndose a acabar con ellos morir dormir nada más con un sueño decir que acabamos la congoja y las miles de decepciones que la carne hereda. Esta es una consumación devotamente deseada. Morir, dormir, dormir, tal vez soñar. Aquí está el problema, pues en aquel letargo de la muerte, ¿qué sueños tendré cuando me haya liberado de este tumulto mortal? Me daría la paz. Este es el respeto que prolonga tanto la calamidad. A no ser así, ¿soportaría acaso los azotes y los desplantes del tiempo, las equivocaciones del opresor, la arrogancia del soberbio, las penas del amor despreciado, la insolencia de los burócratas y el menosprecio que el mérito más paciente soporta del hombre ruin? cuando yo mismo podría alcanzar mi tranquilidad con una simple navaja. ¿Quién asumiría tantos fardos? ¿Quién gemiría y transpiraría bajo una vida agobiante, a no ser por el temor de un algo después de la muerte? País desconocido de cuyos confines ningún viajero regresa. Desconcierta la voluntad y nos obliga a soportar los males que nos afligen antes de arrojarnos a otros que desconocemos. Así, esta conciencia hace un cobarde de mí mismo. Go yet, soft Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief and the entire members of our companies to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far has discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Now follows that you know Fortinbras Investment Company holding a week's supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be colleagued with the dream of his advantage. They had not failed to pester us with message importing the surrender of our profits, those vast countries gained by all bonds of law by my dear brother. So much for him. Now our business is, Mr. Laertes has sued Fortinbras Company's unrighteous strategy. We shall demand a fair retribution for their attempt to take over our investments in Colombian oil companies and Bolivian mines of coal. We await your signature, young Hamlet. That these two, two solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a view. Or that the law had not fixed his canon against self slaughter. Ah, wealth, wealth. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. This is an unwitted guard that grows to see. Things rank and gross and only nature possesses them. But it should come to this. But two months then. Nay, not so much. Not two. So excellent a man that was to my uncle what Gandhi and King to Hitler. So human, so loving to my mother. Must I remember? 
Why? She would hang on him, and yet within a month, a little month. Why she, even she, oh God. Married to my uncle, the beast that lacks this cause of reason, mother man. Now the souls of her most hypocritical tears had left the flushing in her gold eyes. Must we get speed? Pause with such dexterity to sheets. Must we get speed? Pause with such dexterity to answer to sheets. of your suit. You cannot speak of reason to the trustees and lose your voice. What would you beg, Laertes? There shall not be my offer and not your asking. The head is not more native to the heart than is the profit on our investments to your father's work. Why did you ask us here to quit this business and return to Bogota? from which I willingly came to the United States to renovate my contracts under your company's reorganization. Now, I must confess, my duty is done, and my thoughts and wishes bend again to Colombia. It was not me, but Polonius who sent for you. What does your father say? He has, my lord, wrung from me my slow signature. My laborsome petition, and at last upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, accept to place him back in Bogota. My will is yours, Laertes. And now, my cousin Hamlet, my son. A little more than keen and less than kind. That is not a loving and fair reply. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so much, my lord. My swarthy skin tells you I am too much under the sun. Sometimes he walks four hours together along that bridge. Cast thy night a color off, and let your eye look like a friend to these employees of our company. Don't seek with your veiled lids for your father's dust. For like me, you must accept that everyone must die, passing through nature to nothing. Nothingness is our fashion, mother. And why does it seem so particular with you? It doesn't seem, Mother. It is. I do not seem. It is not only my inky clock, or morning suits of solemn black, or windy suspiring of forced breath, no. Or the fruitful river of the eye, or the dejected behavior of the visage, together with all forms, suits, and shapes of grief that can denote me truly. This indeed seem their actions that any man might play. But I have that within which is past is shown. These but the trappings and the suits of war. It is so sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to do these customary duties for your father. But you must remember, your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolence is a course of impious stubbornness, unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to the interests of your relatives still alive, a heart unfortified, an impatient mind, a simple and childish understanding. Because death must be. And that is as common knowledge as to realize that these words were recorded on tape. Why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Fie! This is heaven's fault, death's fault, nature's fault, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers. We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe and think of us as our a father. For let the company know that without your consent you will be replaced and our profits will continue. 
we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of Philadelphia, increasing our income, your father's legacy. I know what is best for you, Hamlet. Let not your mother waste her time and stay with us. I shall in all my best obey you, mother. I think I saw him yesterday night. So? Who? My lord, Mr. Hamlet, your father. The president, my father. Tis in your admiration for a while with an attent ear till I may deliver this marvel to you. Let me hear. In the dead, vast, in middle of the night, two of my friends were encountered by a figure like your father. Wearing at point exactly, he appears before them and with solemn march goes slowly and stately by. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear surprised eyes, and almost to jelly my friends stand dumb and speak not to him. Then I, with them, on the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered both in time, form of the thing, each word came true and good. The apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was these? My lord, on the platform of the graves. Do you know to speak to it? I did, but answer made it none. And yet, once we thought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion like as it would speak. But even then, the morning cock crew loud and at the sound it shrunk and hasted away and vanished from our sight. It's very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true. And I did think it written down in our duty to make you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs. But, but this troubles me. Are you going there again tonight? I warrant I will. Where that ghost assumes my noble father's person, I'll speak to it. To hell itself, Jewel gave and bid me hold my peace. I pray you both, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. I will require your love. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cordial do besmirch the virtue of his will. You and your offspring must fear him. For he himself is subject by his birth. He may not, as unvalued people do, carve for himself. For on his choice it depends the security and increment of his own state. We are but employees. And if he says that he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it. Fear it, Ophelia. Fear it, my dear sister. Your heart is fair, and the canker rolls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. Keep your love in the rear of your affection. I will the effect of this good blessing keep as watchman to my heart, but, good my brother, do not 
some ungracious Republicans do show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, with like a puffed and reckless libertine himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own greed. A double blessing is a double grace. Now you must go to Bogota, Laertes. But before you're leaving, keep these few precepts in your memory. Most humbly do I make my leave, my lord. He had of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pleh. Don't speak like a green girl unsifted in such perilous circumstances. I do believe his tenders. I don't know what I should think. Father, we have decided to marry in honorable fashion. Aye, fashion you may call it. Go to, go to. I know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul and the tongue vows. These blazes, Father, give more light than heat, indeed. I haven't taken them for fire. In this time, I will be scanter to Hamlet in our nightly parting. His entreatments will be placed at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Hamlet believes so much in him that he is so young that desire alone can unfold his promises. I don't believe his vows, for they are brokers, mere beggars of unholy suits. But I would be better to beguile. This is for all. I would not, in plain, give more favors to Hamlet until the purpose of my memory be assured by his demand. Air bites truly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and eager air. What hour now? I think it lies at twelve. No, it is struck. What does this mean? My uncle do wake up tonight and takes his rose. He keeps whistle, and the swaggering up spring reels. And as he drains his draughts of greenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet does bray out the triumph of his pledged. Is it a custom? Ah, Mary, it is. But to my mind, though I am alien here and not to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. These heavy heads spinning east and west makes us target and comment of other nations. They clap us drunkards, and with Swedish phrase they accuse of drug addiction. Indeed, it takes from our income to perform that height, the peace and marrow of our taxes. Angels and ministers of grace, defend us! Be thou a spirit of hell for goblin damned! Be thy intents wicked or charitable! Thou comes in such a questionable shade that I will speak to thee. I call thee Hamlet, the man, the father, the trustee. Answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell me why thy canonized bonds have burst their sermons. Why the sepulchre, wherein we saw thee quietly unearned, had opened his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this be that thou, dead corpse, again in complete cotton, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon? Making night hideous. We fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the riches of our minds. Say, why is this? Wherefore, what should we do? Thank you.
No, by no means. You will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why? What should be the fee? I do not save my life in a pin's fee. And for my soul. What can it do to that? Being a thing immortal as itself? Waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you to the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles over his face into the sea, and there assumes some other horrible form which might drive you into madness and deprive you of your sovereignty of reason? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation, without more motive, into every brain that fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It weighs me still. I'll follow thee. Where will thou lead me? Speak. I'll go no further. Is almost come when I, to sulfurous and tormenting flames, must render I myself. As poor ghost. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall inform. Speak, I'm bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. And the first spirit, doomed for a certain term to work the night. For the day confined to fast and fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of exploitation are burned and porched away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could attain a fall whose lightest word will harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars, start from their ears and each particular hair to stand and end thy kills upon the record for different time. This eternal blazon must not be ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh list, if thou list ever thy dear father love. God, revenge this foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Most foul, in the best it is. But this most foul, strange and unnatural. It's me to know it that I, with wings as sweet as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. I find thee out. And do there shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in easy and let the world. Now, Hamlet, here, it is giving out that is slipping in my orchard, a serpent is tongue me. The whole ear of the company is by a forced process of my death frankly abused. The serpent that did sting thy father's life now sits on his throne. My prophetic soul, my uncle! Ah, uh, that incestuous, that ultra beast with witchcraft of his wheat. The treacherous gifts, all wicked weed and gifts. But half the power sought to seduce, one to his shameful loss, the wheel of my most seeming vicious queen. Oh, Hamlet. While of falling off was there. From me, whose love was of the dignity that it went hand in hand even with the bow I made to her in Merash. But soft, methinks I send the morning air. Brief, let me be. Future pleasures be all my lacks remember. <clears throat> Can I lie again in your lap? Your head upon my lap? I don't mean country matters. My only fair thought is to lie between your legs. What is this? You are too merry today, Hamlet. Who? 
Hi. You're only a yuk maker. What should a man do with to be married? <laughs> I love? Do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his all his arm, and with his hand thus over his brow, he falls into such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last, a little and thrice his head thus moving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. Then then he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for on the street he went without their help, and to the last bended the light on me. This is the very ecstasy of love! Whose violent property foredoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings. As often as any passion on earth that does afflict our desires. I'm glad you gave him hard work of late. Elne repelled his messages and denied his access to me. Could the denial of love make so mad a man? Sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck our likeness. Beshrew your jealousy! By heaven! It is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinion as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. This must be known by the trustees, which being kept close might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, moreover that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So call it, since nor the exterior man nor the inward man resembles what it was. What it should be, more than his father's death, Thus has put him so much from the understanding of himself that he cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and sit so neighborhood to his youthful behavior, that you vouchsafe your rest here a little while in Philadelphia, and by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather as you make lean whether aught to us unknown afflicts and thus the open lies within our remedy. Good gentle ladies, he has much talked of you. Sure I am, two women there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our company. I hope our visitation will receive such thanks as fits a tycoon's remembrance. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. I beseech you to instantly visit my too much changed son. Love is great, the littlest doubts are fear. Where little fears grow great, great love grows there.
you are still the father of good news. Oh, speak of that that I do long to hear. First, let me inform you of our lawsuit against Fortinbras Investment. Hamlet's news shall be the fruits to that great feast. How has he found the head and source of all my son's distemper? I do not doubt but the main thing, his father's death and our or hasty marriage. The government has suppressed Fortinbras Company's interests in Bolivia and Colombia, which appear to our Minister of Businesses to be a preparation against Greek multinational companies. But, better looked upon, he truly discovered that it was against Elsinore Investments. Fortinbras trustees, in brief, have been ordered to pay us $800 million in fines and to make a bow before the court never more to attempt to undermine our interests in those lucrative countries by suborning their variable attorneys. It likes us well. A well-ended business indeed. My liege and madam, to expostulate on what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day and night is night and time is time, were but to waste night, day and time. And since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishings, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Or matter with less art. That he is mad, it's true. It's true, it's pity. And pity, it's true. A foolish figure. But farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then. Now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or <laughs> rather say, the cause of this defect. For this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, the remainder thus, perpend. I have a daughter, a psychologist in this enterprise, who, in her duty, has given me this. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. It is an ill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you should hear more thus. In her excellent white bosom. Came this from Hamlet to her? Stay a while, good madam. Machines are faithful. But never doubt I love. Uh, dear Ophelia. I am ill at these numbers. I have no art to reckon my groans. But uh, I love thee best. Ah, uh, most best. Believe it. This has my daughter shown me, according to our professional responsibility. And she has more tapes of his soliciting as they fell out by psychiatric appointments, all given to her ear. But how does she receive his love? What do you think of me? I fain prove that I am your more faithful and constant laborer. What can we think when you have seen this hot love on the wing? As I perceived it, I must tell you that. What might you and my dear Claudius here think? That I have given my heart to noble winking, mute and dumb? Or looked upon his love with idle sight? What might you think? No. I went straight to work, and Ophelia has deemed Hamlet out of his star. This must not be. And so she decided to lock herself from his resort. Date, but other men receive not his calls. Which done, he, repulsed a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then into a fast, thence a watch, thence into a weakness, and by this declension, into the madness wherein now he raves. Do you think on this? It may be very like. Has there been such a time, I fain know, that Ophelia has positively diagnosed schizophrenia? Would it prove otherwise? Take this from this if it be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where within the center. What may we do to take it further? Mark this encounter if he loves her not.